So, hi everyone. Um, so, this is um, the last session of the day on the importance of leadership, and we couldn't have a better person to kick this off than uh, Mike Barry, who is Director of Sustainable Business at Marks & Spencer. Um, he um, was behind what you might have heard as the Plan A, and um, thanks for your thoughts and Thank insights. You. Thank you. Now, leadership in the context of me usually means he's been around a long time, he's got grey hair, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and be, offer some more useful observations of that. Now, the value of this is discussion. It's not about somebody turning up and giving you a lecture about something that's only of tangential interest to you. I'm a retailer, I'm a shopkeeper, there's not many of you in this room. So I'm going to just bullet point some ideas into the room to generate some discussion when the other good speakers have had their turn up here. And I'm just going to drop it into three different types of leadership. Firstly, personal then about business leadership, and then about governmental leadership. <laughs> and I'm going to draw my inspiration for talking about personal leadership from something that happened here um, at Imperial a couple of weeks ago. Christiana Figueroa, as the outgoing head of the UNFCC, came in and offered her observations at the Grantham um, Lecture. And as ever, she was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And many of you will have been there and will have heard her. So I won't dwell on everything that she said. I'll just take five observations about personal leadership. The first thing she talk, spoke about was win, win, win that done right, climate action is better for the economy, it's better for people. It's the case here in the UK is particularly the case in the developing world. The more action we take on carbon, the more we improve uh, energy efficiency, we save ourselves money, the more we improve the livability of cities, the more we reduce air pollution, for example. There is a whole half hour to spend discussing those triple wins, but I just want to start there, that we need to frame a discussion that is positive about what can be achieved. The second piece of framing that, that she offered was about pace. However good we believe COP21 is, and let, let's be clear, as a business leader, I didn't expect COP21 in Paris to be as good as it was. Lots of imperfections to it, but hey, look what's happening in New York tomorrow. 150 work countries turning up to sign on the dotted line. It's fantastic. But we spent 10 years wasting, twiddling our thumbs. Right now, we're behind where we need to be. We need to accelerate. And whether it's a business, whether it's government, whether it's individuals, we need to work faster. We need to work harder. Her next observation was a very personal one, and that was about gender. And again, I say this very pointedly as a white, male, Anglo-Saxon, grey-haired man of the old establishment, <laughs> that I tend to be representative of the old ways of doing things, the old fossil-based approach. Women tend to be found far more prominent in the new world, the new exciting world of low carbon. So I would say to all of us, whatever we do in terms of leadership, encourage those around you, young female leaders, female leaders of any age, to come to prominence in this space. I've, I've worked in, in business for many a year now, and I see that women tend to work better for each other and for the longer term as well. So again, let's encourage uh, gender parity in terms of, of, of carbon solutions. Christiana also talked about the need for non-state actors to work hard. You know that in this room, whether it's uh, an NGO holding business, government to account, holding business to account for, for what's happening to the world at this moment in time, or whether it's businesses talking a positive narrative about the future, there is an opportunity for all of us to drive a very different discussion in the future. So again, Christiana talking about the need for action, the need for business to be part of the discussion, the need for NGOs to be part of the discussion as well. So just some brief observations I took from, from her as well. The final point about personal leadership is one I would make to all of us in this room. We need the whole of our economy to change. Seven billion people, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of companies need to behave and operate in a different way. But all change, all change because, come because a small number of good people decide enough is enough, this is the way we're going, and here's the inspirational way forward. So I don't care what background you're from, we can all make a difference. And that personal leadership in the whole point about carbon is so very, very important. Now, let me just turn to some, some observations about business leadership. Five, five quick points on this. Firstly, as any business leader, let me say very clearly to you, you must involve your customer. The first 25% of your carbon journey as a business can be done yourself. It's behind the scenes. It's better factories, better farms, better lights, better fridges, better lorries. Something the customer never needs to see. The next 50% of the carbon journey is much harder because it's fundamentally about the products you sell, the products and services that you retail, you offer to the customer. 
Unless the customer can see the benefits personally to them of participation in that new product and service, it'll never take off. And we'll never get to a low carbon economy. So again, over the last four or five years, we've almost put society and citizens and consumers to one side to say, absolutely business and government need to take a lead. They absolutely expect us to do that. But there's a point of reckoning ahead of all of us, which says business models have to be engaging the consumer. And I'll just use the one example at this stage of Tesla. It's a low carbon car. We know that as, 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 as professionals in this space. But to the consumer, it's a great looking car that moves fast, it's desirable, it's aspirational. Why wouldn't you want it? And we have to offer people low carbon products and services like that. Second observation about partnership. As proud as I am of the, the efforts that Marks and Spencer has put in this space, 29 of the 100 original commitments on Plan A were about carbon. We will solve nothing alone. So we've been at the heart of some very good work that the Consumer Goods Forum is doing globally to bring the world's food and drink companies together to work on carbon. Zero deforestation in our supply chains is the aspiration to half food waste, uh, shift to low carbon refrigeration. If we can all do that, $3 trillion of turnover between us, responsible for roughly 5% of all the carbon emissions on the planet, we can make a big dent in the carbon challenge. And we have to work together. Walmart and Tesco's, Pepsi and Coke, Nestle and Unilever, not buzz and buddies. They're trying to beat each other in the marketplace every day. And that will never go away. But we're working together when it comes to carbon. Supply chain. Most of the footprint of many businesses, particularly retailers and manufacturers, is in supply chains. You know, our operational footprint is half a million tons of carbon. You know, negligible. We've got 8 million tons in of, of footprint behind us. For a retailer like Walmart, 25 times bigger than m and you can think of some very, very big numbers potentially. So again, the ability to work with thousands of, re of manufacturers across the planet, of tens of thousands of farmers, of millions of workers, becomes very, very important. Every Marks & Spencer food factory is now on a bronze, silver, gold sustainability ladder, <coughs> driving them forwards to reduce energy, improve productivity, uh, Im improve uh, training and skills in that, in that factory, driving down carbon usage. And they've been told very clearly, those that want to grow our business with us have to get to gold and silver. There is no two ways of doing two that business with Marks & Spencer. Investors, I know it's been a topic that comes up repeatedly in, 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 in Grantham circles when you think about what incentivizes and drives business. Where will the money come from to drive change? At the moment, rather like consumers, they are and citizens, they are a little bit to one side. I think we've seen significant improvement over the last year, year or so about the literacy of investors when it comes to carbon risk. And I hope carbon opportunity. It's a beginning, not an end. And again, we're increasingly talking to our investors about the carbon risk of inaction and what we need to do as well. But it's a beginning, not an end. There is so much more leadership required there. And let me finish on the business point about skills and talent. Again, we've got a leadership team like many, a very good team that works very hard. They've grown up in a particular way of doing business, where carbon was never a predominant issue in terms of business decision making. They've learned that literacy. Our leadership team over the last seven or eight years of doing Plan A. But again, it doesn't come instinctively as if you've been trained at the age of 18 to 21 to do it from day dot. And again, that's why the course that Grantham is offering is so very important to create a different kind of business leadership. Skilled in the customer, logistics, products, sales, buying, and carbon and sustainability as well. So let me just finish my five observations about government. And these are offered humbly as a businessman. You know, there's been a lot of bricks flying around about the, the UK government. It's tough running a whole economy. I'm but a speck within it, let alone the global economy. But let me offer five friendly observations to, to government about um, driving things forward. Fundamentally, I want to see the discussion move from just about adaptation and mitigation. Incredibly important. The UK needs to step up to the plate and deliver both of those. But we're totally missing the real agenda here. And that's how, K how UK PLC prospers in a low carbon economy. Where do the ox exports come from? Where's the innovation? Where's the growth? Where's the jobs that this, this government, any government desires for the electorate that it represents? So what, how do we do that? I'm not going to dwell on it. You know it inside out. The first thing is policy stability. Policies have to change. Policies have to adapt and have to evolve. But they need to do it in a logical, consensual way that people can spot and understand. It's probably not been the case in many countries around the world, including the UK in the last few months. We need to inject that stability in there. We've got it in many ways in the long term. Climate Change Act, Committee on Climate Change, Carbon Budgets. That's been brilliant. World leading. We also need to back that up with the day-to-day -day carbon policies that shape how we do business. The second thing I would encourage the government to do is think about not just the obvious low carbon technologies, the wind and the solar. There's a lot of money to be made out of wind and solar improvement for UK PLC. Don't get me wrong. 
but eventually will become commoditized. In fact, they're starting to. They'll be manufactured at the point of lowest cost within the global economy. We need to be thinking about smart solutions. We need to be thinking about how we get smart cities, smart cars, smart devices. The systemic thinking, that is where the UK will prosper going forward. And the government needs to be encouraging that through the R&D system going forward. Now, of course, to present solutions in terms of systems and joined up thinking, you need, you need a joined up government behind it. So again, we don't see enough evidence yet across DEC, across BIS, across DEFRA, across uh, the Foreign Office, across DFID, all of whom are doing good individual climate work. There's probably an opportunity to do more to bring all that together, to springboard that opportunity in terms of system solutions we can implement, not just in the UK, but export to the wider world. The next point is, uh, you know, very conciliatory from me to government. Lots of people complain about government without understanding what is the true role of government in any marketplace. People expect either too little or too much. And I would encourage government to look at the basic systems that underpin our day of life. Mobility, cities, food, water, all these things underpin our, our way of life. And then break them down into the constituent bits. There's probably 10 moving parts of any um, economic sector in the UK. And then work out which are the ones that government needs to poke and prod through taxes or information or investment or R&D, two or three of the ten, and which of the seven they're going to leave well alone. But we all need some kind of pack that says that's the three that government can make the most difference on over the short, medium and long term, but frankly leave the other seven to the marketplace. And we don't have that level of helicopter view of the sectors that sort of shape the UK economy. And a final point, there's a couple of areas where the UK could really excel cities and food and farming. So again, I want to see the farming base of the UK thought much more about carbon farmers, reducing their emissions absolutely, but creating renewable energy through microhydro, through AD, through solar and wind, but also managing soils and forests in terms of locking up carbon and being paid for it as well. And cities, again, the ability to manage cities in a low carbon way will define, define success in the 21st century for a low carbon future. If we can crack it here, and we should just pick one city and absolutely go for it. There's an incredible marketplace that lies ahead for the, for the UK. So there's just brief observations, bullet points said, personal leadership, business leadership, government leadership. The final points, we stand at a cusp as, as, as a nation, as a global society, where there have been some great words put on paper. The hard yards start here. 2016 is a point of pivot where we go from trying to be a less bad economy to a fundamentally better one. Thank you very much.